right, it is now 10 o'clock, so we're going to get started. I'd like to say good morning and welcome to Introduction to Cataloging. Um, I am Kathy Crump, and one of the cataloging librarians here at KDLA. During this session, we will uh, mute that for a second. Uh, during this session, we're going to, I'm not going to actually teach you how to catalog because that would be virtually impossible within this hour but I am going to give you a nice introduction to cataloging and uh, see why the catalog is important to you and your patrons <clears throat> and you, you, the library staff. And I am joined by Kim Usery, one of our CE consultants. She's gonna be taking care of our technology needs today. So if you have any problems with presentations, just chat in and she will help you. So I'm going to share my, share my, uh, presentation, which I forgot to do. All right. Okay, so uh, to <clears throat> we're just going to do a few housekeeping things. Uh, to ask any questions or report any technical issues, we're going to use that and use the chat. I will try to stop periodically to answer questions, but if I don't, uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, the slide PDF is available under uh, PDFs and slides in the Blackboard Learn window. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be available within about a week. Uh, captions are available two ways. You can click yes at the top of your screen to see the captions within Collaborate or you can click on the stream text link in the chat, which I believe, yes, that uh, Kim has put up there, and you can uh, view them in a separate window. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started. And we're just gonna start off with the basics. So what is the catalog, and what is cataloging and why do we do it? Cataloging is a word that libraries use when we talk about how items in the library collection are organized. By cataloging and entering them into a centralized online system, we make them available for all. Okay. Cataloging answers the questions, what do you have in your collection and where do I find it? Even small libraries have a large number of items, so you can't just throw everything on the shelves and hope that somebody's gonna find what they want. Without the catalog, your patrons will be searching a strange and possibly unfamiliar place without a map. So you can compare the catalog to the index of a book. You look in the index to find one specific thing so that you don't have to read the entire book to find what you're looking for. The same can be said uh, for the catalog, which tells you where to find a single item without having to browse the entire collection. The catalog also has information that's useful for searching, such as the author's name, the title, and some subjects. So when you see all this information on the computer screen, we call it the catalog record. So how do we know how to catalog? So we're gonna follow some rules. So in the mid to late 1800s, librarians began to consider collections from a worldwide perspective. Previous to this time, librarians created the cataloging information for each individual item for his or her individual library collection. And each library did things a little bit differently. There was a lot of duplicated effort since many libraries had same or the sim had similar or the same items. So the idea of shared cataloging was developed, which allowed libraries to share bibliographic information with each other uh, to keep from duplicating the work and to decrease the amount of effort that the cataloger expended on each item. Librarians at that time saw the value in library, libraries organizing their collections in a consistent manner so that a patron could find any type of item in any library quickly and efficiently without having to learn a new system. And the idea that patrons should be able to find items based on the author, title, or subject began to take hold at this time. The, these themes of consistency and shared effort led to our first set of cataloging rules. So in 1908, the American and British Library Associations jointly published the first sets of cataloging rules in separate editions for each country. Then ALA published a second set of American rules in 1941 and again in 1949. 
Then after years of international meetings and drafts, the American, British, and Canadian Library Associations finally published the Anglo-American Cataloging Rules, or AACR, in 1967. AACR 2 was the second edition of AACR 2 and was published in 1978. AACR 2 was the standard for many years, but it was created back when libraries were using four by six inch cards to describe mostly print items. Um, many catalogers said it needed major revision because it was kind of awkward to catalog digital and non-print items using AACR 2. So now we have RDA, or Resource Description and Access. Uh, RDA was published in 2010 and was fully implemented by the Library of Congress in early 2013. And it was recently revised in 2021. The RDA guidelines are found in an online resource called the RDA Toolkit, which can be accessed with a paid subscription. All right, so now that we've had a brief history on cataloging, and an introduction to what the rules are, to the rules, I have someone to introduce to you. This is Bob the Book. And Bob has appeared at your library, and we're gonna follow him on his journey to your library uh, collection. So the first step in Bob's journey is to decide what type of cataloging we would need to do. We talked about this during our brief cataloging history, but there are two kinds of cataloging original cataloging and copy cataloging. Original copy, uh, cataloging means that you are creating a new record basically from scratch and you must decide what goes in the record. It can take hours depending on the item you have in hand. Uh, this is what librarians used to do for everything before the idea of shared cataloging or copy cataloging came along. You're typically going to do original cataloging for rare or local items. Most of the time, though, public libraries do shared or copy cataloging. This means that you're reviewing the cataloging of someone else and making sure it matches what you have in hand. Uh, usually we're talking about spending maybe a few minutes instead of hours. So we'll probably use copy cataloging for Bob. So where do copy cataloging records come from and how do you start, how do you get them? Well, there are several ways to find records, but here are a few, and we're gonna start with the big sources. OCLC, which stands for Online Computer Library Center, is a global library cooperative. Excuse me. You can join OCLC, but it's not cheap, and that is a problem for smaller libraries. One of the services they provide is WorldCat, which is a huge database of bibliographic records from libraries around the world. The database currently contains over 521 million records and is growing quickly. So the chances are your item will be there. If, you're, uh, if your library does ILL through OCLC's WorldShare ILL, which most of us do, this is the database that it uses. Another popular way to get records is through the Library of Congress, or LC. They are smaller than OCLC. They currently have over 19 million records. But the big advantage is that you can download records from their catalog for free. The huge difference between OCLC and LC is that LC is a functioning library for Congress. So the types of records that OCLC holds compared to, compared to LC varies greatly. OCLC re accepts records of different levels of quality from not only libraries, but also from vendors and publishers. And the quality can be questionable on some of those records. And there's also a lot of duplication of records in OCLC. On the other hand, the quality of LC's records is usually very good. LC is mainly meant to be a research library for Congress. <laughs> their records reflect their collection. Not as much variety as OCLC, but there's still a lot of records for popular materials in their catalog. Another source for catalog records are the vendors from which you purchase your materials or perhaps your library systems vendor. Some vendors provide catalog records with the items you purchase, usually for an additional fee. Lastly is the Z39.50, which is an international standard for computer-to-computer -computer information retrieval and is freely available on the internet. 
If you go to this website from LC, you can see multiple libraries. You can search multiple libraries at once, including LC, and retrieve records that are identified as part as the result of a search. So then you have the possibility of getting multiple records at once, and then you can choose the best one, which can be downloaded into your catalog. Uh, I've included this link on a, on a handout that you can download after this class. Um, all right, so after searching, Bob has found a record for himself and he enter, then enters into the next leg of his journey, which is description. At this point, we're gonna see how well the record he chose matches his description. And for that, we will consult the rules. The rules, or RDA, tell us how to record this information so that it is consistent with other libraries. Some of the things it talks about is when to use abbreviations, which is not very often, how to capitalize using punctuation, and the language to use. The rules also give us instruction on transcribing information, which for most of these elements, uh, it is copying it exactly as you find it on the item. Another important thing we get from the rules is the preferred source of information, which tells us what part of the item we use as the basis for our description. For a book, we start with the title page. Next, we answer some important description questions about the item itself. I usually start with the title and the statement of the responsibility. The title is the name of the item, which sounds very simple, but sometimes there can be issues with that. For instance, in a book, the, titles on the, title the title on the title page says one thing, and the cover says something different. Which one do you use? That's why we have the preferred source rules, but you do record all the titles, just not in the same area. The statement of responsibility is simply who is responsible or who created it. In the case of books, it's usually the author, but you can also have illustrators, translators, and editors. We also include information about editions, and different editions do matter. If your patron is trying to find the most recent information, you want the most recent edition. So you want that to record that information in your cataloging record. Another part of our description is publication information, such as where something was published, who published it, and when it was published. The publication information is important for identi identifying the item. And as we discussed with editions, the publication date is important for knowing how recent the information is. We also include a physical description about the item. For books, this could be how many pages long is it? Are there illustrations or maps? Is this book in portrait orientation or landscape? How tall is the book? And this is measured in centimeters and not inches. Answering these types of questions helps us determine if the record we chose matches the item that we have in hand. All right. We also include information about series, if it's on the, if it's, if it's on the item or we can get it from another source. Is this part of a series? What number in the series? Sometimes information we have doesn't quite fit in any other part of the catalog record, but we still want to record that information. To do so, we put it in a note. Notes can include summary statements for what the book is about, contents notes for what's included in the book, notes about the audience level, is this for children or for adults, lexile levels, etc. You can also include language information. Is this book in English? Spanish, is it a translation? You can make notes about more series information and also specific information about the library's copy, such as it was signed by the author. One last part of our description is standard numbers for items, which include, which in the case of uh, books, is the International Standard Book Number or the ISBN. It's good to include these standard numbers because they are extremely helpful in searching. Okay, now that Bob has been described and his record matches him, yay Bob, but how can patrons find him in the catalog? And this is called access in cataloging. We create access points, which are bits of information that help us retrieve a catalog record. Here are the main types of access points in bibliographic records. Names of people, such as authors, illustrators, editors, Names of corporate bodies, such as state and federal government agencies, schools, churches, 
We also have titles such as the title of the work or series. And sometimes we have a combination of name and a title, such as a series by a specific author. So I define access as naming things. I mean, that's really all you're doing. And this leads us to uh, a concept related to access, which is called authority control. This is a very serious sounding name for an important topic, but it, it isn't really life or death, as it sounds. Uh, it always makes me think of the military for the, uh, the authority aspect and Janet Jackson for control. And now that I have uh, dated myself quite a bit, let's go on. <laughs> Authority and control is establishing and maintaining consistent forms of terminology that are going to be used in a catalog record. We take things like names and subjects and establish a single authorized form for cataloging. So why do we do this? Well, this is cre but while by creating an authorized form of a term, it disambiguates it from others that are the same or even that are similar or even identical. And we do this by creating an authorized heading, which is called an authorized access point in RDA speak. Okay. The first reason authority control is important is that it gives us a way to bring together all instances of a name or title, no matter how the name or the title is found on the resource. I have a background in cataloging music from a previous job. So I always use this example. Let's take the composer, Peter Tchaikovsky who's famous for his ballet, The Nutcracker, and Swan Lake, and many other things. This is an excerpt from his uh, Library of Congress authority record. And this long list is the different ways his name has been spelled on publications. <clears throat> and that's only a fraction of the ways his name has been spelled. Due to the, all the various ways his name has been spelled in English and other languages, the only way to bring together all the resources with all those different spellings is through the use of an authorized access point in a catalog record. That 100 field there at the top is the official version of his name. Oops, let's go back here for a second. And all those little 400s there, in, whoops. All the 400s here are all the different variations, just some of them. Okay, so the second reason that uh, authority control is important is sort of the opposite of the first reason. So before we were trying to bring together things, but now we're going to use authority control to help distinguish between two or more things with the same name. When you and I think of Stephen King, we probably think of the famous horror and suspense writer. But there's a lot of other Stephen Kings out there writing books. These four have all written books. The first one's a marketing expert. The second one writes about economics. The third one is a communications professor. And the fourth one is our scary horror writer. So if you're looking for The Shining, how do you keep the other Stephen Kings out of your search results? Well, you're going to add something to their name that makes them unique from the others. Usually it's birth or death dates, but we can also add things like middle initials, as you can see in these examples. So when you're cataloging a book by the horror author, you're going to use the form here with the 1947 to the present. And if you use that form on all his books, it will ensure that you find them all together in the catalog. And that is authority control. This also brings up an important concept called collocation, bringing terms together uh, that belong together. Collocation is one of the most important parts of organizing a library collection. I mean, that's what it's all about. All right, so once you've established, established a unique name or of a term, you're going to create an authority record for it. It's a lot like a catalog record, only instead of having information about an item, it has information about a person or a subject or a place, etc. There are official files of authority records, and the one that's used by many libraries is maintained by the Library of Congress. Uh, in the Library of Congress authorities file online, you'll find nationally authorized headings for subjects, names, titles, and name title combinations which can be downloaded for free into your library's catalog. But you can also have local uh, authority records, authority headings, if you have special items in your collection by an author that no, no one else has established a heading for, you can create one, uh, an authority record in your catalog, which will collate items by that author. All right, 
Subject headings are another example of authority control. They are a controlled vocabulary of terms used to describe people, places, things, and concepts. The opposite of a controlled vocabulary is keyword or natural language. Um, subject headings are <coughs> unique words that have been authorized by an organization such as the Library of Congress and tell us what something is about. So why should we use subject headings in instead of natural language? Well, first of all, slang comes and goes, but authorized subject headings are usually constant unless there is a serious justification for a change. Second, re records with for authorized subject headings bring together synonyms for a word. Um, if there were no subject headings, you would need to think of all the possible terms that could be used for a topic and search on them. Also, if subject headings are applied properly, a search using a subject heading would yield greater results than a search just using natural language. Let's uh, look at an example of how this would work in real life. So let's think about garbage. Someone might use the term garbage and someone else might use the term rubbish or trash. Uh, but instead of taking the time to search all those terms, you could search on refuse and refuse disposal which is not exactly what I would think of searching on, but we'll go from there. So this is why natural language is actually a great way to start your search. But once you found that subject heading in the record in an online catalog, there are typically hyper, these are typically hyperlinked. And so one click is going to bring lots of results. So if I were doing a search in a catalog, I would start with garbage. And then that would probably take me to the, the actual one I find. Okay, so headings also help people find materials that may be about multiple topics. For instance, we have the book Agrarian Kentucky, which might be of interest to people who want information about agriculture, but it may also interest people who want information about Kentucky history. By putting these different subject headings in a catalog record, you help people interested in various aspects of the book find it. So our book has an agriculture heading but it also has headings to show that it covers Kentucky history in certain time periods. And using a subject search in the catalog, both groups of people would be able to find this book. So here's how subject headings might look in a record in your catalog. And this is actually a, a record from Elsie's catalog for our book, Agrarian Kentucky. Uh, the first term on the left is the main topic. You can include subdivisions under the main topic which lets you give further information about the subject. Common subdivisions are geographical, like Kentucky or United States, topical, like history, or they may have to do with time periods, such as this example of 1865 on. Sometimes it's necessary to create your own subject headings, but for the most part, there are good ones out there already. Uh, the most widely used subject heading list is the Library of Congress subject headings, or LCSH. Uh, these are used to be published in a set of big red books, but can now be downloaded in PDFs for free from the Library of Congress's website. It has been ma maintained by LC since 1898. Um, it's research-based and sometimes uses more complex terminology than the average person because it's technically meant for LC's collection. Um, there have also been concerns that uh, there is a bias to the Library of Congress subject headings and um, so they are looking at updating some of those headings, but it's still a, a, a subject heading thesaurus that is used widely. You also have the Sears of, list of subject headings, which was first published in 1923. It's meant for smaller public libraries and school libraries. It uses natural language terms to describe topics and changes frequently with popular culture. Uh, it's a much smaller list and is used by fewer libraries, but it is still in use and still being published. And then you have the BISAC, which stands for the Book Industry Subject in Category. Subject in category. It's a newer list which was introduced by the Book Industry Study Group, which is a professional organization for the book industry. Uh, these are natural language terms, not really subject headings. Uh, it was meant for the book industry, but it's being used more and more by public libraries who want to provide a bookstore browsing experience to their patrons. But whichever system your library chooses to follow, it's most important that the headings in your catalog are maintained with 
national changes so that they stay current. If not, they, they lose a lot of their effectiveness. All right, so subject headings describe what an item is about, but there's also a way to describe what the item actually is. And these terms are genre and form headings. Uh, genre terms are used for works that share similar plots or settings or themes. So books where someone's trying to solve a crime are mysteries. Books where two people fall in love are romances. Uh, mystery fiction and romance fiction are, are genre headings. Form headings are used for works that share a particular format or purpose. Examples would be audiobooks or graphic novels. Just like with the list of subject headings, there are multiple lists of genre form headings as well. Um, <clears throat> the main one you'll to run into now is the LCGFT or the Library of Congress genre form terms list. Um, that one's being maintained by the Library of Congress and updated on a regular basis. There's also the GSAFD, the Guidelines on Subject Access to Individual Works of Fiction, Drama, etc. Uh, the GSAFD is no longer being updated, uh, but you will still see them being used on records. Uh, there are lots of thesauri out there for genre and form terms, especially for different areas. There are some for architecture, art. There's a lot of them out there, so you can use ones that are appropriate for what you're cataloging. Okay, now that we've talked a bit about access and authority control, let's see what Bob's access points would be. The only person named in connection with Bob is the author, whose name is Charles H. Bogart. And this is how his name is found on the title page and the cover of the book. So we're going to use that form unless we find that it is different in the authority file. It's not. So we're good to go with our name access. Now we have two subject headings for Bob. The first subject heading is a specific subject heading for the Louisville and Nashville, Rail Nashville Railroad Company. And we've added a topical subdivision for history and a form subdivision for pictorial work, since this is a book of postcards. We've also included a more general subject heading for railroads and a geographic subdivision for southern states, since this is about more than just railroads in Kentucky. Uh, we can also still add the history and pictorial works subdivisions to this heading, too, if we, if we wanted to. All right. So Bob's been described and named, so we found him in our library catalog, but how do our patrons actually find him in the collection? That's when we use a classification system. All right, so you have to have a uniform way of telling people where items are in the library, and this is where classification comes in. Classification is basically organizing things and is a way to group similar items together. In the library, we use call number, which is the address of the item that tells you how to find it. A call number can be letters, like FIC might mean the item is fiction. Call numbers can also be numbers. For instance, if you saw the number 636.8, you'd know that this item is about cats. Call numbers can actually also be letters and numbers together, alphanumeric. And then call numbers are assigned using a classification system. The two most popular are the Library of Congress classification system and the Dewey Decimal classification system. LC's classification system reflects their collection, which is more research-based and it's typically used in, in uh, university and college libraries. Public and school libraries usually use the Dewey Decimal System. The DDC was developed by Melville Dewey in the 1870s. Dewey was looking for a way to organize all the known information in the world at the time. He did plan for some future knowledge to be added, but had no way of knowing just how much the world would change. So newer fields of knowledge can have some really long numbers. Okay, so how did Dewey want to classify the entire world of knowledge? So he started with the uh, highest levels of knowledge and broke them down into 10 main classes, which I've included on this slide. And each of these 10 main classes can be broken down into 10 more classes, then 10 more, and so on. So we're going to take a brief look at Bob's call number. So for Bob's classification number, we start in the social sciences in the 380s for commerce, communication, and transportation. 385 is railroad transportation, so we're getting very close to Bob's number. 
And if this were just a book about railroads in general, we could just stop right here. But we have the geographic aspect for the book, so we're going to need to take it just a bit further. Okay. So what's coming next is the decimal point, followed by another number, which is how we get the decimal part of the Dewey Decimal System. The rules tell us that we can use a subdivision for geographic treatment, decimal 09, which we add to our 385. So far, so far we have 385.09. Okay, you didn't know you were going to do math today, did you? Okay, so next we want to add more specific geographic information. So we're going to go to a table of geographic subdivisions and we find 76 for South Central United States. You can find even more specific numbers for states and counties, but we're going to stick with this more general number, which covers Kentucky and Tennessee. So once you add all those numbers together, we find that gla uh, Bob's classification number is 385.0976, but we're not done yet. Once you have your call number and a huge pile of books on a topic, how do you differentiate those books from each other? We add information to the end of the number. This is usually either the author of the title, if no author, and possibly a date of publication. And this is called a cutter. It was named after Charles A. Cutter, who co-founded the American Library Association. Back in the day, you used to have to build an alphanumeric number using a table called a cutter table. The tables were printed in huge books with thousands of numbers. And here's an example of a chart from a cutter table which we actually have here at the State Library. So, but now you can use a free downloadable program for OCLC called the Dewey Cutter Program, which generates in the cutter for you. So entering the name Bogart would generate B6743. So Bob's call number would be 385.976 B6743. And if you had multiple editions of the book, you could add a year onto the end. But most libraries have gone away from doing a traditional cutter and simply use like the first three or four letters of the author's last name. And this is easier for browsing, but not as good for organizing. Works by authors with similar last names tend to get mixed up. And then there are times that we don't use Dewey for fiction, biography, and also for graphic novels. When Dewey, was first, when Dewey first created the DDC, the world of knowledge looked very different, including fiction. There were works of literature by Shakespeare and Dickens and others, but fiction wasn't as widespread as we know it today. Technically, fiction could go under the 800s, but that would get really crowded really quickly. So instead, you'll usually see like an F or an FIC or maybe even a genre code with the first few letters of the author's last name which allows for unlimited growth and browsing. Now, biographies should go under the 920s, which creates a couple of problems. First, the numbers differentiating people would get huge. And also, 920 puts biographies in between geography and history on the shelf, which is really not a great place for browsing, but it is possible. So you might want to, you might actually see a B or a BIO with the first few letters of the subject's last name, not the author of the book. Now, graphic novels can be cataloged with the Dewey number 741.5, but this squeezes them into one number and buries them in the middle of your nonfiction collection. Um, I myself would use some type of collection code such as a GN, and cut her for the character or for the series and separate them into your adult, teen, and children's collections, not group them all together. You can use Dewey for these specific areas that we've mentioned, but most people who read them just want to browse. They don't want to have to look through all these other sections. So it really comes down to being a service to your patron about where you put your biographies, your graphic novels, and your fiction. All right, so after much deliberation, we have Bob's call number and cutter. We use the first four letters of the author's last name as our cutter. And so Bob's number is 385.976 and B-O-G-A. Okay. So, you know, we've learned a lot about Bob on our journey. We have a description for Bob. We have access points. We also have a call number. 
but what do we do with all of Bob's information and how do we make it searchable? Okay, so libraries used to use thousand catalog cards filed away in big card catalog drawers to organize the items in their collection. Eventually, we figured out that we could use machines called computers to do it for us and do it faster. And it was at this time that MARC was invented. MARC stands for Machine Readable Cataloging. It was created by an American computer scientist named Henriette, Henriette Avram, who was working with LC in the 1960s to develop a method to help librarians search all parts of the record quickly and at one time without needing to search multiple paper files. To be able to do this, we needed to create a language to communicate with the computer. And MARC is what we use to tell the computers how to find library materials. It's not a cataloging standard like AACRT AACR2 or RDA. MARC is an encoding standard or what the library staff sees on the back side of the catalog record. Information like the title, the author, the publisher is assigned a number and a series of letters to help the computer identify it. Programmers then write catalog programs instructing their computer to do on what to do with that information. And what you end up with is the catalog record. So this is in a, a catalog record for the book Crash Course in Cataloging for Non-Catalogers from LC's catalog. As you can see, there's information about the format, authors, title, physical description, subjects, along with other information. But where does this information sorcery come from? Well, if we click the Mark Tags button here at the top of the screen, we're going to find out. So this is the flip side with the marked data. Each of these rows is called a field, which has a three number code or a tag and contains your basic information. For instance, the number 245 means that it's the field that displays the title and statement of responsibility. And the fields can be broken down into segments or subfields, which have letter codes. These are offset by little hash marks called delimiters, which tells the computer that each of these segments are separate sets of information. There's a lot of co other codes that go into the MARC record, but unfortunately we don't have time to explore all those codes. Um, in some of your library systems uh, cataloging modules, you may, you may not even see the MARC tags. Instead, you might fill in fields with natural language descriptions like a field called author or title, but mark is what your system is using on the back side of that. So just as RDA was a replacement for AACR2, librarians are looking for a replacement for mark. So why does mark need to be replaced? Well, mark is an older way of, look, of thinking about library data that focuses on individual records that live inside our catalogs. Mark records have information that has value outside the record as well as um, things like authors' names, subject headings, series information, etc. These are things that libraries do really well, and, but because our records are locked away in our catalogs, or as they like to term it now, our silos, using a standard that no web community uses, they can't be accessed by tools, web tools like Google. So, librarians are looking at linked data as a way to pull information, library info data out of the silos. Linked data is a way to help computers understand how data is linked to each other by creating relationships. And it's a whole lot more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. When linked data is combined with next generation catalogs, the hope is that you'll be able to find an item at the library that's closest to you by searching Google. And there have been some, uh, pilot projects for this, um, such as LC's BibFrame, the bibliographic framework, which hopes to replace uh, MARC with a linked data, data model to make library data more useful inside and outside of the library community. But these are still works in progress with no set timelines for implementation. Okay, so Bob has come to the end of his cataloging journey He's been stamped, labeled, and barcoded, and he's ready to go out there and impart knowledge to the people. So now that we've talked a little bit about all the different aspects of cataloging and what goes into a catalog record, we're going to take a brief look at why cataloging is important. So cataloging records unlock your collection for your patrons and you. 
They answer the questions, what do you have in your collection and where to do I find it? Without the catalog, you're relying on serendipity as your search engine. To continue with our garbage theme from earlier, you may have heard the saying garbage in, garbage out. Well, this is true for your catalog. Your catalog is only as good as the records you put in it, and library systems can't make up for bad records. It doesn't matter what bells and whistles your system has, if there isn't good information, or if there's virtually no information in your catalog records, your patrons aren't gonna find what they want or need. And not retrieving any results in a search is very frustrating for patrons. So as I mentioned when we talked about description, here's the type of information that you want to find in good cataloging records, authors and titles and editions and publication information and dates, uh, the format or physical description, subjects, summaries, and so much more. You remember that when I talked about the MARC records, um, this is, when I talked about MARC records, this is why this matters, because good cataloging records include coding of this information, which really affects your search results in your public catalog. Uh, your library system uses this information recorded in your MARC records to create indexes, which facilitate the searching of your collection. Some examples of these indexes are for names and titles and subjects and keywords. The coding also affects the display of your catalog. So let's take a look at that next. So this is your typical patron display in an online library catalog. He or she has done some type of search and you usually see a brief display of each item in your search results, depending on what settings you've got set. And then on the left-hand side of this screen, you're gonna see different aspects or characteristics of the item in your search results. And these are called facets or filters, um, which can be used to narrow or filter your results. And then from the brief description, this brief display, you can usually click on a fuller display. As you can see that there's all that information, description information that we talked about earlier. You've also got your access points. All this information has been packaged together and is hopefully easily searchable by and understandable to your patrons, which makes the catalog important for them. Now we're gonna look at how the catalog helps you, the library staff. The first way the catalog helps you is with reference. Our former, our former reference supervisor at the State Library always said that understanding how the catalog worked really helped her to better serve her patrons, especially when she discovered subject headings. Uh, searching subject headings along with keywords helps you to find all the resources on the same subjects. Another way your catalog can help you is with readers of, or viewers advisory. I know that there's a lot of great resources out on the internet, such as Novelist and Goodreads and Internet Movie Database, but your catalog can also have a, be a great source of information for readers and viewer advisory. Plus, you also have the information about what you have in your collection and where it is right there in one spot. So just think of the questions that your circulation staff might receive from your patrons, such as, I want to watch a movie about World War II. Can you suggest one? Off the top of my head, I don't know what the subject heading for World War II is. I mean, I do have a good guess, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna start with a natural language term to search. So I did an initial search for World War II with two eyes and found a record with something about World War II. I clicked on the hyperlink for the subject heading for World War II, which is World War 1939 to 1945, and got a lot of results. Then I've used the filters or facets to narrow down my search and to come up with a few suggestions that are available in my collection, or in this case, the collection of the Lexington Public Library. The catalog also helps you get the right version for your patrons. So I want the version of King Kong from 1933, not the one from 2005. And notes are usually the place to look for this type of information, as you can see from this note about the original release of the movie. And we also want to make sure that we get the right physical format. I want the DVD of that movie, not the Blu-ray version. So having accurate physical description is important to the patron to get them the right format that they need. So as you can see here, um, we have a brief physical description which tells us that we have a disc of some type. We all also have this cute little icon there that tells the kind of disc. 
This type of icon comes from the coding in the catalog record and can be very useful for easy identification formats of formats. Uh, each library system has different kinds of icons with varying amounts of information, so not all library displays will have the, this detailed of an icon. But there are, these are some of the easy ways that you can make sure that you have the right formats. Another important use of the catalog is for collection management. It helps you answer the question, what do you have? Having full description of an item in your catalog helps to identify the item for an inventory and to identify the item if you need to charge for replacement costs. The catalog is your inventory and it proves that, you've, that you have the items that you used your funds for. So having an accurate inventory is good fiscal management. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our webinar. And just a word about your cataloging powers, or as I like to term it, with great power comes great responsibility. If you are cataloging at your library, use your cataloging powers wisely. If you aren't cataloging, be nice to your catalogers because they can make things very easy to find or hide them forever. Okay, so thanks for hanging in there with me, everybody. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, we have a question here about using MARC. What should you put in the 100 field when the title page lists the editor and the illustrator and the verso lists someone else as the creator? Okay, so the 100 field is, is for your creator, is for the person who is responsible for creating the content. So I would put the creator in the 100 field. Uh, Editors and illustrators are associated to the resource, but they are not in charge of creating the resource. So those usually go in 700 fields. That was a very good question. Do we have additional questions? Any questions out there? All right. So if no one else has any questions, we'll go on to our wrapping up for our webinar then. Uh, so on this uh, slide, I've included a few introductory cataloging resources some of which are in KDLA's collection and can be ILL'd if you want to check them out. Uh, some are available in Kentucky Libraries Unbound, so you can check them out from there as well. Um, I also have included some additional ones on a handout that you can download uh, along with the uh, PDF of these slides. All right. And we want to say a special thank you to the Institute for, of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, who uh, provided, provides the funding for our uh, webinars and our continuing education that we do. Uh, without them, we could not put these, uh, pr these presentations out for you. All right, so let's wrap up just a little bit. Uh, our, this re uh, webinar was recorded and will be available probably within one week. Uh, there is a, going to be a link to a short survey that's going to be put in the chat and your uh, responses are very important to us for our continued federal funding. Um, and then also a, a PDF of the slides and a handout of the extra cataloging information are available under the slides and PDF and slides in the Blackboard Learn window. Uh, it won't be available after the webinar, so please download it now. And then lastly, a um, certificate of attendance will be available in your learner dashboard within one week. All righty. Um, so unless someone I, has any other questions. 
All right. I would like to uh, thank you for attending. Um, and I hope this was informative for you. And I hope to do some more specific cataloging webinars uh, probably in the new year. All right. So thank you all very much and have a great day.